Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. Don't know how to say it. They 
are awkward when it comes to talking about what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what they want to avoid. And I think what you said before, you know, yes, we all had those health classes where we learned the diagrams and here are the tubes and here's how the egg meets the sperm, right, in health, and we learned that young enough. But that's about it. You're launched with the, you know, the fundamentals. And even that isn't linked to when, where, and how it's supposed to come into your life and what form it's supposed to take and how it's supposed to be, you know, sort of nurtured and, and cultivated in the intimacy of a relationship. So people, exactly what you said, they wind up feeling ashamed or shame around their thoughts, their feelings, their desires, and they wind up feeling embarrassed to even pursue or ask sometimes very basic questions. So how do you encourage people to just sort of jump in the water and swim through and swim past the embarrassment or the shame that typically holds people back? You know, I don't think everyone needs to plunge, the, you know, the way that I do. We all have different personalities and we have different uh, comfort levels and certainly it's a growing uh, process and a, a journey for everyone. Um, what I what I try to do and what seems the most effective, I'm, since I'm a health and sexuality writer, you know, I'm always researching these topics and uh, I write articles about it. And on my blog, I, I try to keep the tone, you know, very conversational and, and authentic. It's, it's really what I'm thinking about. And um, I found that when I share, you know, personal stories, uh, mine or sometimes other people's stories, people feel a lot more comfortable because they realize that when they hear it, it doesn't, you know, they don't feel uncomfortable. They don't feel uncomfortable when I talk about, you know, the first time that I ever had sex or masturbation or encouraging masturbation for women, uh, which was something I didn't, I didn't masturbate until I was 30. And I'm very comfortable talking about that. And once I, once I do, other people will sort of, sometimes, you know, there still is a bit of, um, I, I find that people comment less, for example, on my blog slightly when I write about sex versus other topics. But what happens is every time I've gone to a, a conference or an event, um, you know, and somebody recognizes me from my, my work, they come up and they'll, they'll talk to me about personal experiences and not in a shameful way. Um, so I think just starting the conversation is the big thing and giving people perspective, uh, talking about sexuality in a very empowering way instead of in, you know, black and white terms or with rules or telling people they have to think a certain way. Uh, I try to be very open-minded as far as the, the topics and the audience because a lot of men also read my blog and not in a way of, you know, for the most part, I think it's because they really care about women and they really care about female sexuality. And by and large, everyone's been incredibly respectful. So I think setting the proper tone, asking questions, sometimes using humor because sex can be really, really funny. We all have these kind of embarrassing stories. And I've had some very brave individuals who've actually said, you know, I've never talked about this before, but now I feel like I can. And they will post comments. They will email me. And so it's really about, I think, uh, from a personal standpoint, just taking baby steps. Maybe it's reading more. I think awareness is really huge, starting with, you know, where where am I in this journey of sexuality? Do, how do I feel about my body? Do I know my sexual body parts? One of the most common clicks that I get on my blog uh, is, a, is of a diagram of the female sexual anatomy. And it is, I'm, I'm quite confident many people still don't know where the clitoris is or mm. what the labia are. You know, it's, it's a really fascinating um, thing. So starting where, where we are comfortable and knowing that, you know, you don't have to do it in any specific way. It's about awareness, exploration, and, and you know, communication and really honoring that part of ourselves because I think too few women set that as a priority. We're kind of socialized to, um, you know, withhold that part of ourselves and yet we're kind of in this over-sexualized culture where we only see, you know, these kind of pornographic images of female sexuality and knowing that, you know, real women are, you know, we have a lot more in common and more to learn from each other 
than I think a lot of people realize. I think that's such a great point. And you know what I love, August, about what you're sharing today is that for you, the way that you really have broached sex along the course of time has really been to personalize it and warm it up so that by your talking about your own experiences, it's almost as if you're having a conversation with your girlfriend when people are writing to you and, and, and tuning into your blog. It's not as if they're talking to everybody or, you know, shouting it out. It's like it's a one-on-one -on -one where you've made it comfortable and open and safe to address the questions, the curiosity, the concerns that so many people have. And, you know, by, by warming it up, it makes it, it, it's as if by you talking about it, you've given yourself permission and you're giving your audience the permission as well to talk about it with you. Sure, very well said, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like Thank play. You. It's like, you know, you don't just, you don't just like dive into the middle part. You have to, right. you have to warm up. And, and, you know, everybody's different in that way, but I do think, and thank you for saying that, that's something that I, strive for is the, because, you know, clinicians and, and uh, experts like you are invaluable, and I, I actually, I have your book on my Kindle, it's, it's great. Oh, um, thank you. And I think it's really, really important to have many different kinds of resources um, and to, uh, you know, start where we feel the most at ease, and for, for some people that's, you know, hearing other people's stories, and I think eventually, whether they share on my blog in comments or some people have written their own stories after reading something on the blog or, um, you know, whether they communicate with me or not, I, my hope is that they, they gain a little bit of insight, learn something about themselves, and uh, just start that, that exploration. Right. That self-awareness, raising the self-awareness. I remember saying to a patient last week, we, we were talking about how she's first tuning into sexuality. And so I said, well, you know, what do you fantasize about when, you know, when you're masturbating? And she said, just the fantasy of masturbating is something I've never had. That, like you said for yourself, there are so many women out there who have not known that it's a green light and it's okay to explore one's body, to give oneself permission for pleasure, to enjoy oneself, and to be able to um, tap into one's sexual energy and use it, as you had said early on, to empower yourself and to really harness that energy so that it's something that enables you to be both creative and dynamic and bring a certain vitality and energy to all your interactions and everything that you, that you go about in your life. Absolutely, and you bring up such a great point. It's not just about sexuality. I mean, that's just, it's, it's a huge and a tiny part because it's, it's one of the most basic parts of our lives, our, our sexual health, our, our capacity for pleasure. And the more that we become empowered in that way, it, it feeds into every aspect of our lives. And I know that from personal experience. I know that from talking to hundreds of other women, uh, reading other people's stories. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like this, you know, Wild West time where for generations sex was not talked about at all. And then, you know, our parents... Some, some parents don't know when or how to talk about sexuality with their kids. Sex ed is pretty lacking in, in many communities. And, you know, we're going to learn it somewhere. And, and the resources aren't always, um, you know, the, the greatest or, um, you know, the most um, applicable to our lives. So, you know, having reasonable standards. Body image is such a huge part of the whole thing. And I feel like, you know, one of the pieces that gets missed out of, you know, there's all these drugs coming out for female sexual dysfunction, like the female, like Brita, which I recently wrote an article about, and, you know, that they're equivalent to uh, Viagra for women. And those things can be very important for certain people, but it's very rarely talked about the fact that 90% of women have body dissatisfaction. It's amazing. That's yeah, almost it's, every single one. It's pretty staggering, right? Everybody wants to change something about their body. You, you, it's true. You know, I want to just go back. You made such a great point about the, you know, women embracing their sexuality and their sensuality and letting themselves have pleasure and talk about it. It made me think just last night I was watching my new favorite uh, comedy on MB. I guess it's a, I don't, I don't know what channel it's on, but in any event, the, the one uh, with Mom, called Mom with Allison Janney and um, Anna Ferris. And it's generational. It's a, a mother, grandmother, mother, and her daughter. 
and in this they were broaching a conversation on sex and the uh, the youngest daughter is pregnant and she wanted to talk to her mother about you know the boyfriend wanted to have sex with her while she's pregnant and, and she he doesn't want to have sex with her she wants to have sex and she wanted to ask her mother about positions and her mother like attempted to talk and have the conversation and then finally she just said you know I can't do this and better you just skip the whole thing <laughs> so if she, could, if she said in this way if you, we don't talk about it you're not going to have sex with him you know while you're pregnant but it, it was funny in you know in the timing and the comedy of it but in fact in light of what you're saying those are the subtle messages that go on and perpetuate. We're all uncomfortable talking about sex. Even when you ask your mom about it, she's going to be uncomfortable. Don't put her on the spot. And, you know, no, better you don't have sex with your boyfriend if you're pregnant because you don't want to start to explore different positions. And with, until you just said that, I, I didn't even realize, you know, to me it was watching a comedy, ha, ha, how funny. But what a backdrop it is to a certain message around sex and women interesting it really is and that's an excellent point and it it is it's funny and it's also very sad you know a lot of humor comes from truth and right. that you know even those subtle kind of messages can really resonate huge we as soon as we hear you know it's easier to say oh no just forget about it then you know the desire doesn't go away so then we either suppress it which is incredibly unhealthy mm -hmm. and we at some level are feeling negatively about our bodies and feeling like our urges are wrong uh, or we engage and feel ashamed of it or you know or in that case the woman's probably terrified that something will happen to the baby and all these I mean these are huge issues and even between uh, the couple <clears throat> excuse me the, the partners they don't always communicate about things so I remember during the World Sexual Health Day panel, I believe he said something along the lines of, "Do you are you comfortable asking for what you want?" Mm. And that is huge. I think that you know, some I've heard from many women that they just don't talk about sex while having sex or really any time. Other than I mean, there'll be little tiny little flirtatious conversations with their partner, and that's. You know, we don't need to have these, you know, gigantic discussions. I mean, I, I like to have those, but not everybody, <laughs> not everybody needs to. But if you can't say things like, you know, what, what makes you feel good or let me show you what makes me feel good or, you know, and putting it in a, in a positive light, I think those things are huge. And, you know, when we ask somebody and they just shy away, trying to say, you know what, that's not a wall. That is an opportunity to either try to, you know, cultivate communication with that person, whether it be a parent or a teacher or a partner, uh, or, you know, it's, it's something to seek, you know, information somewhere else, somewhere from a quality resource, you know, somewhere that you can really hopefully have a conversation. And I really do think that uh, our girlfriends are good resources, um, you know, uh, and certainly reading as much as we can. I think that's such a great idea and so true. And for so many women, you know, I hear from them, they'll talk with their girlfriends, but even then and there, things get watered down or edited down for fear of judgment. You know, particularly if there's any issue going on around frequency of sex if you're you know if you're if you're grappling with a little bit of a you're on the brink of or in the midst of a sexless relationship or you're you know the sex has just fallen down for 101 different reasons so you're having sex once a week once every two weeks once a month once every three months once or twice a year I mean it, it there there are many couples out there where the amount of sex has just diminished dramatically and either one person is okay one person's okay with it, and on the one minute, we'll come back and talk about the one person who's not okay with infrequent sex. So stay with us here at the Let's Talk Sex Doctor on Call at HealthyLife.net. On March 6, 2004, Tom Pierce, his wife Joanne, and his daughter Lisa were on the water taxi that overturned in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Tom survived, however, his wife Joanne and daughter Lisa did not. 
Tom's book, The Last Rose, is about the first year of Tom's life after the accident and the many signs that helped him through it. Tom talks about the accident, but it's not a book about the accident. It's about the power of love. Love as we know it and understand it, and love that goes beyond our understanding. It won a Next Generation Indie Book Award for the Best Inspirational Book. And you can learn more about the book and find links to purchase the book on Tom's website, www.thelastrose.com. It's available in hardcover, Kindle, and no conditions. The Last Rose may be the perfect book for anyone who has experienced the loss of a loved one. That's www.thelastrose.com. www.thelastrose.com. What about me? How to Stop Selfishness from Ruining Your Relationship. It's the brand new book from Dr. Jane Greer. With 25 years of relationship counseling, Dr. Jane Greer has heard the same questions and seen the same patterns about selfishness in relationships. From wondering if you're living with the most selfish person alive to wondering if you are the one with the selfish tendencies, Dr. Jane Greer will help you see an option to the never-ending fight. Stop the guilty pressure of selfish sex and other actions and pressure to do everything to reprove your love in a relationship. Vanessa Williams, the actress, says Dr. Jane Greer's book, What About Me, is a must-read. This book is both insightful and empowering. You, too, can end the selfish game and move from me to we. Find out more about Dr. Jane at drjanegreer.com. Also, find What About Me on Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, Sourcebooks.com, independent bookstores, and any place else books are sold. Karma. Good karma. Good karma means the Good Karma Collection, a jewelry line embraced by some of Hollywood's biggest names and featured as a style-setting piece in People's Magazine. The Good Karma Collection is a timeless, stylish gift for teens, men, women, anyone. A unique collection of sterling silver jewelry, all designed to promote good wishes and good karma. A percentage of profits is donated to cancer-related charities across the USA. Check out the engraved Chinese characters representing positive energy, harmony, success, or their bestseller, a sterling silver pendant on a silver ball chain. Affordable, beautiful, and good karma. Found at Zero Minus Plus Boutique at Fred Siegel in Santa Monica, California, or call 310-395-5718. That's 310-395-5718. All positive talk with a mature edge. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Sex Show here at HealthyLife.net. I'm Dr. Jane Greer, and I'm talking with my guest who is writer and sexuality expert August McLaughlin. Read her blog at AugustMcLaughlin.com, and she's also the author of In Your Shadow. You know, I just want to quickly go back to, for anybody out there who may be dealing with the, you know, the infrequent sexual experience, you've encountered that, I'm sure, in, in your travels, right, August? Oh, absolutely. I hear about it very often. And I think one really important thing, you mentioned everybody has different frequency issues and different desire and difficulty talking about it. It's so important to know that whatever frequency you're comfortable with and whatever issue you're having, is okay. It's right. You know, I think there's so much shame. Before I started my blog, talking to girlfriends, you know, when I would talk about sex or sexuality, I noticed the discomfort, you know, and, and a lot of times there's like this comparison thing. Like if one of us is having sex regularly and another one is, you know, has lost her desire, there's no shame in that, you know. It's a, it's a sign that there's something to be addressed, and in that way, it's a tool. So, you know, knowing that it, it's perfectly fine if, if you have a very high – I've actually received quite a few messages from women who have uh, more sex drive than their partner and feel ashamed right. because they feel that's wrong. Right. right. Exactly right. And then wind up feeling rejected because their partner simply has a different level of desire. It's not about finding them less desirable. They just want to have less sex or have sex less often, and that's just about their own thermostat, their own, you know, their own speedometer. And so to know that it's not something to be ashamed of, to talk about it, to check out differences and to figure out what and how you and your partner can find that middle ground and sync up so that you can, you know, continue to open up the um, avenue for talking about your sexual needs. And speaking of, you had said something at the very top of the show, which I thought was really intriguing in terms of your own 
sort of late blooming development sexually because it was an outgrowth of your eating disorder and a byproduct of it. Do you think there's a connection or did you find a connection for yourself in terms of your eating disorder and really controlling and, you know, regulating your body through food in that way and limiting your sexual energy and sexual desire? Absolutely. I think that body image and sexuality, the issues are almost inseparable. And whether you have a full-fledged eating disorder or disordered eating, which affects the majority of women and many men as well, uh, it, it, it always affects our sexuality. Um, so, you know, when, when I, I had anorexia, so in, in the disease actually rids you of your femininity and your sexuality. So you lose your sex drive, you lose, uh, you know, your curves, you don't menstruate. I mean, you become asexual. So it, mm. it, if you're empowered first sexually, there's a very good chance, and many studies show a strong link between positive body image uh, and, um, you know, people who have a healthy sex life. Women who masturbate are much more likely to not only have positive body image, but have happier sexual relationships with their partners. So, you know, I, I definitely think there's a link, and it's, it's been a real gift for me because it's given me such a sense of purpose, not only in my own life, but, you know, in, on a greater scale. And, and I think that's such an important point. And do you think the, the eating disorder stems from, in any way, feelings of, of awkwardness or embarrassment or shame about any kind of sexual awakening or sexual desire as a, as a child going into latency and then into your teen years when sexual urges are full force and, you know, just running rampant. Do you think that in some way the body image and the, you know, attempt to control one's body is also an attempt to control and bridle some of those urges? There's definitely a huge, huge correlation. Uh, eating disorders are very complex, but one of the, you know, pillars, I guess you could say, uh, one of the commonalities among, amid all of them um, is a, a, a sense of body shame that stems from insecurity. And if you think about it, you can't have, you know, uh, a happy, healthy sex life and sex drive and all this if, if you loathe your body uh, mm -hmm. and if you, you almost try to disconnect from it. So I don't think, you know, had I had more uh, sexual empowerment early on, I don't know if I would have developed an eating disorder, but I do know it wouldn't have gotten as severe. Mine was near fatal. Wow. Um, it, you know, it's, it's one of those um, it's chicken or the egg kind of things for a lot of people, but I do think that whether we're told this directly or we get it kind of as a subtext, we are taught that, you know, a lot of us women are taught that we should just not go there, meaning don't don't touch your vagina, don't look at your vagina, don't, you know, don't don't be over overly sexual, which oftentimes just means, I mean, we're born sexual creatures. And if we don't know that, then we have all these urges. If we deny them, it only makes things worse. So for me, my brain chemistry and a lot of, uh, you know, adolescents were going through all these hormonal changes. Definitely, if, if I had masturbated when I was, you know, going through those changes and having all these desires and uh, stifling them and not even really understanding what they meant or where to put them, you know, it, for me, I became quite depressed. And I think that's very common. Other people get very stressed, very anxious. Substance abuse stems from that kind of thing. Uh, so definitely, I, I think that um, everyone deals with it on some level. There are very few exceptions in our culture. Well, you know, before we run out of time, because your little snippet of your experience is so fascinating and intriguing that you will absolutely have to return and share more with us for all the, the women out there who are wrestling with the embarrassment, the discomfort, the shame, the, as you said so eloquently, the loathing. I mean, I'm just flipping in my mental, you know, um, Rolex of so many women that I know, they, they, they hate their bodies, they can't stand their breasts, they hate their, their, their bottoms, they give them their stomachs or no good really can't stand it. And in addition to which, we, we are out of time, so you're definitely going to have to return and share with us your, your girl boner coined term so we can hear all about it because you've just been so enlightening and so informative with such an essential and vital topic. So 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. And we're already looking forward to your encore and coming on back. Oh, I am as well. Thank you so much. You take care. And we'll be back here at the Let's Talk Step show at HealthyLife.net in just a minute. So stay with us, everybody.